So hi. Here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hi, I got stints. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Emily and I'm a librarian with the Oakland Public Library. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us and then to give you a, a brief library commercial before we get started. Uh, my cat just jumped up next to my computer. So if you heard a little scrambling sound, it was the cutest cat in the world making a nuisance of herself. Um, so um, I'm really happy to introduce this continuing partnership with the East Bay Regional Park District. Uh, Na Naturalist Constance Taylor will give a virtual presentation every other month on the first Tuesday of the month. Um, so coming up, we'll have uh, on February 9th, I believe, Mig Migrating Birds on April 13th, Urban Wildlife, and on June 8th, Edible Stories. Um, and then I also wanna take this opportunity to just make sure that people know that the library is open, although services are different than they used to be. So most of our locations are open for sidewalk pickup. Um, so if you need books or DVDs or CDs, you can place a hold on what you want and come pick it up when it's ready. We are still open, even with the new orders, the new shelter in place order. Um, and we also have a robust selection of online resources. So if you want to try reading ebooks or streaming movies or streaming audiobooks, you can find all of that on our website. Uh, if you don't yet have a card, we're also giving out cards virtually. So go ahead and visit our website at oaklandlibrary.org or give us a call. Um, the phone number is 510-238-3135 and we can get you a library card. Um, and then my final plug is for the Bookmark Bookstore, which is on Washington at 7th over in o Old Oakland. Uh, this bookstore is run by the Friends of the Oakland Public Library and the money that they, the money that you spend there um, then is donated to the library to fund our programming. So um, we have a few people in the Zoom here with us and a few more people over on Facebook. If you've got questions on Facebook, I can um, shuttle them over here to the Zoom with Constance and she is super friendly and loves to answer questions. So go ahead and, and let me know and we'll get them uh, passed on to her. Um, and so without further ado, Constance, um, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We'd Absolutely. Love to hear what you have to say. Yes, thank you so much. And I would also like to give a plug to the bookmark. That is an amazing bookstore. There is a, it's a bargain at twice the price and all of the money goes towards a good cause. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and Facebook or whatever. I love questions. I will answer them to the best of my ability. So my name is Constance Taylor. I am a naturalist with the East Bay Regional Park. And to start out, I want to acknowledge that all the district parks, as well as all the other places where we live, work, and play in Alameda and Contra Costa counties are on unceded indigenous territory of the Ohlone, Bay Miwok, and Delta Yokut peoples. So today we are here to talk about the amphibians who live on this land. And I'm gonna share some stories and information that I have. And I absolutely encourage you to share stories and information you have. So I am not an amphibian expert. I am an amphibian enthusiast and nobody knows everything and together we know a lot. So please feel free, free to chime in with your own information as well. So I wanted to do a, just a super quick overview of the East Bay Regional Park District in case folks are not familiar. Um, hmm, hang on a second. I don't think that I actually shared my screen. Let's do this. Okay, there we go. So this is a map of all of the different parks in the East Bay Regional Park District. There's about 72 parks and um, thousands of acres of open space, thousands of miles of hiking trails. And we exist only in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. So if you have been in a park in one of those two counties and you see this little green leaf, then you know you are on an area managed by East Bay Regional Park. And we are what's considered a special district. So that means we are a governmental agency, but we are not city, we are not state, we are not county, and we are not federal. We are our own governmental entity that exists only within Alameda and Contra Costa counties. So um, 
a lot of our funding comes from property taxes, which means that these are all 100% public parks. They are literally your parks. Even if you pay rent, part of that rent goes towards property taxes for your landlord. So they are absolutely your parks. So I hope that um, you are able to come out and enjoy them because there are many, many things to explore, including amphibians. So it is amphibian season, or uh, it will be um, as soon as we get rain. So February, or sorry, uh, fall is, fall and winter are generally amphibian season. When it starts to rain is really what you're looking for. So when it starts getting wetter out is when lots and lots of amphibians come out for mating. And one of the reasons that they do come out is because, you know, the ground is wetter, things are not bone dry, they can come out of their burrows without desiccating. And there's also vernal pools. And vernal pools just means seasonal pools. It means they are pools that are around when it's wet and then later on in the year they completely dry up. So they are not wet year round. Or they don't have water in them year round. And these are also really important breeding areas for amphibians, not only because there's water, but also because there's no fish. Because when these pools dry up, it means fish can't live there. And fish are actually pretty major predators of many amphibians around California. So what have amphibians been doing this whole time during the hot dry season? Well, generally they are estivating, which is just a word that means summer, hi summer hibernation for the most part. And so they have been hanging out in ground squirrel burrows and pocket gopher burrows. Um, I was actually at Brioni's a couple weeks ago and there's a cattle pond there that's usually has water in it year round and there was no water in it. And the mud was cracked kind of in that puzzle piece uh, pattern that happens when mud gets really, really dry. And I was looking down in those cracks and I saw dozens and dozens of newts down in those mud cracks. So they're just hanging on the best they can during the dry season, trying to find whatever moist, damp shelter they can. So today is going to be a general species of or survey of species who you can find around here, as well as some broader contextual information about conservation and natural history in the Bay Area and beyond in regards to amphibians. So um, this is one of my favorite amphibians in the area. This is a spadefoot toad who I will be talking about um, in just a little bit. But first, just some context. What makes an amphibian an amphibian, say versus a reptile? One of the major things is metamorphosis. And that just means when the larval version of an animal looks completely different than the adult. So, you know, frogs go through metamorphosis from a tadpole to an adult, as do most newts and salamanders. Most, but not all. Um, and this is versus reptiles who tend to hatch out of their eggs looking like tiny little versions of the adults. So snakes, lizards, turtles, tortoises, alligators, crocodiles, animals like that. So metamorphosis is one big difference between amphibians, reptiles, and other animals. Another major thing that makes an amphibian an amphibian is gas exchange through the skin. So amphibians have really moist, wet, kind of slimy skin versus reptiles who have skin covered in scales or birds or humans. And their skin is a really important respiratory organ. And there's, there's pretty much no barrier between an amphibian and the outside environment. They don't have like a tough barrier um, that their skin makes like humans do or like reptiles do, which means that amphibians are really, really susceptible to pollution in the environment because they don't have that protective barrier. Their skin doesn't really work like that. And so often amphibians are talked about as canaries in the coal mine because they are some of the first animals to be affected when something is going wrong in the environment. And lastly, um, and this is not, you know, these, these three are just very general. It's not the only things that make an amphibian an amphibian. But uh, generally, they need to be near fresh water, both as adults and as young. And one of the interesting things that I stumbled across was um, 
Because they need to be near fresh water, this is actually one of the reasons why it's thought there are not many native amphibians on islands. Because it's a lot harder for an animal to travel to an island to start colonizing that area if you can't travel across large distances of salt water. So that was pretty, it makes sense, but I just hadn't thought of that until I actually read it somewhere. So moving a little bit deeper into amphibians, we have frogs and toads. These are two of our native amphibians around here. And one thing to remember about this is that all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So generally the, the frog order is a neura. And then as you split that order into different families, that's where the toad classification starts to come in. So frogs generally have smoother, moister skin. They often need to be near water as adults and they have really large back legs and they tend to hop to move themselves around. Versus toads who tend to have thicker, drier skin they can be further away from the water as an adult, so you can find toads in some pretty surprising areas that seem like they would be too dry for amphibians. They also have this really cool paratoid gland behind their eye, and this is a gland that secretes toxins when they're working to defend themselves, and it tastes really gross, and I wouldn't be surprised if it would make a predator sick as well. Toads also generally have stockier back legs, and they tend to crawl to move around versus hop. Another major difference between frogs and toads are their eggs. And this is really, really cool to see. Frogs tend to lay their eggs in masses, like really big blobs of eggs, versus toads who tend to lay their eggs in these really cool strings. And also both of them uh, need fresh water to reproduce and they're both carnivorous. So the other major category of amphibian are newt versus salamander. So similar to frogs and toads, all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. And I intentionally chose this California newt and this yellow-eyed Encetina because they look so similar. And honestly, there aren't tons of differences between newts um, versus the larger category of salamanders. <clears throat> Generally, salamanders um, are, are amphibians who have tails as adults versus frogs who generally only have tails when they are juveniles. Another really, really cool thing about salamanders is they can all potentially regenerate really complex anatomical structures. And so that's, you know, tails, which a lot of animals can regenerate tails, but salamanders take it many steps further and they can regenerate limbs. They can regenerate eye tissues. They can regenerate heart tissue. They can regenerate big parts of their central nervous system, which is astonishing. And so there's active research being done to see if any of these regenerative properties can be applied in any way to human use. It's really interesting stuff. And uh, generally all salamanders secrete some kind of toxin through their skin and are poisonous to some degree. So generally salamanders are not good eaten. And when we're talking about newts, newts tend to spend most of their adult life in water, um, certainly more so than um, salamanders who are not newts. They often have rougher skin and they do not have these structures here. These are called costal grooves. And I've got another picture of them here. So salamanders tend to have these costal grooves, which are permanent indentations in their skin. And it's thought that those are actually there to increase the surface area of their body for increased water absorption. Versus the California newt, these are not permanent indentations. These are like little chub rolls on the side, just kind of like skin folds. Um, so these are, these are not costal grooves. These are just kind of, you know, ridges from baggy skin versus these, which you can see they're quite uniform. So this is kind of a, a general count of 
different numbers of species within California and the Bay Area. And I'll just leave this up here and let you take a look at the numbers while I kind of talk a little bit more about amphibians in general. So you might have heard that amphibians are threatened around the globe and there is a sustained global decline in amphibian populations. And unfortunately, California is no exception to this. As we're thinking about this, it's worth noting that amphibians have been around for 300 million years and have survived four mass extinctions. So if they're having a hard time surviving in our current environment, then that's really something to pay attention to because these are not fragile creatures. They're actually quite tough and resilient. There's evidence that amphibians may be declining faster than any other type of vertebrate animal. And these declines could be due to environmental degradation, even within what we might consider pristine wilderness. So that means that we are seeing declines in amphibian numbers even in areas that um, we consider relatively untouched, like the Sierra Nevadas or the Amazon rainforest or places like this. So why amphibian populations are declining is relatively unknown. And chances are it's not just because of one thing, but it certainly does seem to be linked to uh, habitat destruction and diseases like the chytrid fungus. And if you're unfamiliar with chytrid fungus, it is a type of fungus that attacks the keratin in amphibian skin, which makes it very hard for them to breathe. And it can also cause neurological issues, which changes behavior and um, makes them act in a way that probably is not helpful for their survival. Other issues in addition to that are air pollution and increases in, in ultraviolet light, the introduction of native as well as non-native predatory fish into streams and lake that previously did not have fish, long-term fire suppression, extended drought, severe freezes, and a combination of all these things. <clears throat> So um, again, this is why scientists are very interested in amphibians because studying them can kind of start to point to everything else that's going on in the environment as well. So there are declines in population. Um, one of the reason the declines are not more drastic than they otherwise could be are um, because of laws. And these are just some reasons, certainly not the only reasons, but there are some laws in place that are helping to slow species decline. And I'm gonna bring these up because I'm going to, uh, in the different species that I'm highlighting, I um, say whether things are state or federally uh, endangered or threatened. So I just wanna make sure that um, we're all on the same page as far as what that means. Now, these two laws, the California Endangered Species Act and the Endangered Species Act, are definitely not perfect. However, the situation of amphibians and many other species would be far more dire without these two pieces of legislation. When we're talking about the California Endangered Species Act, this was passed into law in 1970, and it is actually the most comprehensive of all the state acts when it comes to the Endangered Species Acts in uh, different states in the country. <clears throat> the amendments in it are modeled after the various federal acts that predated the Endangered Species Act. I'll talk about that in a second. And CESA provides, uh, CESA is California Endangered Species Act. It provides a way to list species as state or federal, or state or uh, state endangered or threatened. Sorry, I'm getting myself tripped up. Um, CESA also prohibits the taking or trafficking of species who are listed. The first Endangered Species Act statewide was Nevada in 1969. And to date, only four states in the country do not have a state ESA. And what that means is they rely solely on the federal Endangered Species Act for regulations. So as far as the Endangered Species Act of 1973 is concerned, this was not born fully formed. This is kind of the product of many iterations. And before the ESA of 1973, it had primarily been up to states to manage the welfare of species within the borders with very minimal uh, federal help. 
So there were two acts that came before 1973, and that was the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966 and the Endangered Species Conservation Act of 1969. Both of those gave very limited protection to species. And when the ESA of 1973 was passed, this was um, a law that gave more protection than any previous law to endangered plants and animals. And that is because it not only protected the listed species, but also that uh, the habitats that the listed species needed. And um, it, it not only talks about biodiversity and ecology and the need for those things, but species are also listed under the ESA for um, many types of values, including aesthetic, historical, educational, scientific, recreational. So it covers a wide variety. And to date, the ESA is still considered one of the most effective conservation laws in the world. So we have these things who help protect, uh, or sorry, these laws who help protect our species. So we have our uh, first species who we're gonna talk about right now. This is the California red-legged frog. And this is a state endangered and federally threatened species. Now, this is actually a pretty large frog. It's, I, I believe, the largest uh, native frog in California. Sorry, one second. And this is a frog that used to be very, very abundant in the state. And now, unfortunately, you can only find it in scattered areas. Some of the reasons for the population decline are American bullfrogs and habitat loss. And bullfrogs actually are considered one of the main threats. Um, they are, the bullfrogs are the reason that often California red-legged frogs will be only found in seasonal water versus year-round water. Shouldn't say always, um, often more found in seasonal water versus year-round water. Um, and that's because bullfrogs will eat red-legged frogs and they are also a carrier of chitrid fungus. Um, there, the California red-legged frog is actually part of literary history, believe it or not. If you have <coughs> ever heard of the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County written about by Mark Twain, that celebrated frog was the California red-legged frog. Gold miners would catch red-legged frogs and then, um, you know, compete to see whose frog could jump the farthest. And these competitions still exist. Ironically, the frog that is used is the bullfrog, probably because they are hefty jumpers and they are not illegal to possess. Whereas you cannot capture or um, otherwise harass, um, as it says in the law, a endangered species. So uh, one of the reasons it's called the red-legged frog, you can kind of see it's got some red on its legs here and on its stomach. And when it's flipped over, you can see that red coloring a little bit more clearly. Next up, we have our Sierran chorus frog. And uh, this is a frog that many of you might have interacted with before or heard. It's a really common frog. <coughs> definitely not endangered or threatened. Their populations are doing just fine. And this is a amphibian who's a really great example of a habitat generalist. And actually a lot of amphibians in California are pretty uh, tolerant of different habitats, which means that they don't really rely on a specific food or a specific temperature or plant association or a substrate, and they can kind of live in many different places, which is another reason why it's concerning when our California amphibians are having a hard time, because they're usually pretty hardy. And the Pacific chorus frog is found in pretty much all regions across the state. Fun fact about the Sierra and chorus frog, sometimes it's also called the Hollywood frog, because if you have ever heard frogs, um, making sounds at night in a movie, regardless of where that movie is supposed to be taking place, uh, chances are it is Sierra and chorus frogs you're hearing. So back in the uh, good old days of Hollywood, there were sound stages, but the land around the sound stages was relatively undeveloped. And so when sound engineers were looking for background noise, 
they would just go out to the undeveloped land outside of Holly, the Hollywood sound stations and just record the frogs. And that's the sound that made it into lots of different movies. And to this day is still usually the frog, the chorus frog sound you're gonna hear. <coughs> Woo, excuse me. So next up we have woo the American bullfrog. So the American bullfrog is um, not originally from California. It hails from kind of the southeastern part of the United States and it was introduced by people. And it is considered invasive because um, it has a voracious appetite and generally tends to become the dominant amphibian in any ecosystem where it is introduced to, at least as far as California is concerned. Um, to be fair, lots of frogs eat everything um, and many frogs are cannibals. So here you could see a American bullfrog cannibalizing its own species. This is a pretty great photo. <coughs> and many frog species do this. The difference is that the American bullfrog is really big and so it can pretty much eat whatever it fits in its mouth. So the bigger it is, the more different types of animals it can eat. And here's another really fun picture of an American bullfrog eating a bird. Can you believe that? <coughs> like I said, pretty much anything they can fit in their mouth, they will eat, including rodents, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And they are also prolific breeders. It's wild. The female can lay up to 12,000 eggs at one time, which is pretty bananas. <clears throat> Usually they're in these massive egg mats, kind of like this. And um, take that in comparison to the Pacific chorus frog, who we just met. The Pacific chorus frog can generally lay around 400 to 750 eggs at a time. So 12,000 eggs versus 400 is significant. <coughs> so next up, we've got our Western toad. Oh, the thing I forgot to talk about with the Pacific chorus frog, in case you were wondering, sorry, they can actually change color. The thing to look for for identification is this black stripe that goes right through their eye. Their color and patterns might change, but that black stripe will not. So next up, we have our Western toad. And here you can see that paratoid gland oozing toxin. It's kind of this milky white stuff. And as far as markings to look for for the Western toad, this is really, um, aside from the spade foot toad, the only toad that we really have around here, at least as far as Alameda and Contra Costa counties. <clears throat> and so uh, this white stripe is also a dead giveaway here. And, um, you know, generally Western toads, they try to make themselves unpalatable, but it doesn't really work. They're eaten by all kinds of other animals, including these uh, garter snakes. The other way that they defend themselves is they try to puff themselves up really, really big so they can't get eaten, but it does not seem to be working for this toad. And this is one of my favorite amphibians, like I said, the Western Spadefoot Toad. Move over, baby Yoda. Am I right? Look at that face. So these toads are not only adorable, they also have really interesting life cycles. They spend the vast majority of their life underground, and they can live for a long time without eating or without coming up to the surface. Uh, they go into a um, pretty intense estivation mode and they can live without food for months, if not years, while they wait for the rain to come. And when that rain comes, they pop out of their burrow, they mate, and then they are back in their burrow, um, probably in a matter of hours. <coughs> Certainly, they don't tend to hang out above ground for very long at all. So spadefoot toads are... Um, they're very patient breeders. Like I said, they can wait a long time until conditions are right to breed. And they generally lay around 300 to 500 eggs when they're breeding. One of the major um, causes of their decline is habitat loss. <clears throat> it's thought that 80% of spadefoot toad habitat 
has been developed, which is astonishing, 80%, that's a huge amount. And they do rely on vernal pools um, for their mating and their eggs as well. So it's actually thought that the increased protection of other vernal pool animals, such as fairy shrimp, have probably helped the survival of the Western spadefoots. And that is going to be um, an important kind of proxy animal, the uh, fairy shrimp, until the Western spadefoots can get a listing of its own. Because right now it's a state species of special concern, which has very limited protection. Um, it would be much better if it could be upgraded to threatened or endangered to really get the full protection of the law. <coughs> Another really cool thing about this toad is that they have, they're named for these little spades on their feet. So these black things here are hardened areas of skin, and these are the spades that they use to dig their burrows. And, um, they so one of the diagnostic things which is pretty silly and you don't necessarily need it because these are pretty distinct amphibians but if you're ever curious to know if you're looking at a spade foot toad or not you can try to smell it um and they are they smell a little bit like peanut butter not all of them but some of them do this is me sniffing a spade foot toad and um, it did actually smell like peanut butter and as you can see they're very small amphibians as well We have the foothill yellow-legged frog as well. And unlike a lot of other um, of our amphibians, there's actually not a whole lot that's known about the habits or life history of foothill yellow-legged frogs. And again, similar to the red-legged frogs, they have that same area of coloration on their legs and belly. So that's how this frog gets its name. It is thought that the yellow-legged frog has disappeared from about 45% of the original range that it used to be in. <coughs> Two of the major threats to this frog are releases of water from dams if it's during their breeding season. When there's an increase in water rushing out from a dam that can actually break their eggs away from the rocks that they're attached to and wash them way too far downstream or wash newly hatched tadpoles downstream. And that just makes it a lot harder for the eggs or tadpoles to survive. Another major threat are introduced predatory sport fish like bass and sunfish and their appearance in the lower watershed of the Sierra Nevadas actually directly coincides with the decline in populations of this frog. So moving on to the tiger salamander. Um, the tiger salamander and the California red-legged frog are pretty important indicator species of overall health of the environment in certain areas. And I'm gonna get to that in just a little. I'm just planting that seed in your head. So the California tiger salamander is a type of mole salamander. <coughs> and mole salamanders generally spend most of their lives underground in burrows. Um, often made by other animals like California ground squirrels and pocket gophers. So believe it or not, California ground squirrels and pocket gophers are actually extraordinarily important to the survival of amphibian species in the Bay Area because their extensive burrows make it very easy for amphibians to find shelter from the heat. So like the spadefoot toad, the tiger salamanders are only above ground for relatively short periods of time when they're traveling from their burrows to breeding sites. And these are, you know, classic, classic adapt adaptive behaviors to amphibians who have evolved to live in our uh, dry Mediterranean summers. So again, once it starts raining, they come out of their burrows to seasonal ponds, slow moving waters to spawn. And again, they rely on vernal pools. And a lot of their breeding habitat has been lost to development. But cattle ponds have actually helped fill in the gaps. So cattle ponds and ranching have actually become these extraordinarily important tools of amphibian conservation. And if you have ever seen a cattle pond in a park, 
it looks kind of gross. Like there's just these like super deep hoof prints in the mud and the water looks like chocolate milk. And you're just like, ah, nothing could possibly live here. But that is actually not true. There, are, Those ponds are teeming with life underneath the surface. And um, I got a story that I can share with you a little later on about um, one time when I had the um, the privilege of being able to experience what was happening under the surface of the water, because it is astonishing. There is, it is a, it is a deceptively calm pond when you look at a cattle pond, but usually there's a lot going on underneath the surface. These larvae here of the tiger salamander are also excellent mosquito control in those ponds and other pools. So another thing to think about when we're talking about amphibian conservation. So we have our California newt, which are definitely, um, I think, one of the more well-known and charismatic species of our California amphibians. So they are famous for their newt balls. So this is a newt breeding pond. The adults generally kind of live in oak woodlands and grasslands and in burrows and all of that stuff during the drier parts of the year. When it gets wet is when they migrate to back to their birth pool and all the males and females congregate and start to breed. And so you get these giant puddles of newts all over the place, which is pretty incredible. And this is a newt larva. I have these cool little external gills here and just a kind of a newly metamorphosed baby California newt. Um, generally an adult newt from like the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. Um, they're, you know, they're sizable. I guess I would say that they're maybe like five to six inches, four to six inches long, more or less. And um, these newts are famous because they are actually one of the most toxic animals in North America. And you really only have to worry about it if you are trying to eat a newt. Oh, and here is a newt with um, egg sacs. Generally, these sac egg sacs are going to be stuck to vegetation under the water. And here is a picture of one of the only animals who can eat a California newt, and that is the garter snake. Um, it's thought that there's kind of been this evolutionary arms race between newts and garter snakes where the newt will get a little bit more toxic to prevent the garter snake from eating them. And then the garter snake will evolve a little bit more resistance to that toxin. And then the newt will evolve a little more toxin. The garter snake will evolve a, a little more resistance. So some people call this the red queen effect from Alice in Wonderland, another literary reference. Um, because when Alice is talking to the Red Queen, the Red Queen says something along the lines of, oh, well, where I live, we have to keep running and running faster and faster just to stay in the same place. And so um, that's how the Red Queen effect got its name. And interestingly enough, it's thought that the, this, this Red Queen effect is actually starting to come to an end because uh, scientists who have been studying this toxicity relationship uh, the hypothesis is that the California newt can only be so toxic before it starts to poison itself, which is really interesting because that toxicity is in the skin. The in part, the, uh, like the guts and internal organs of California newts are actually not toxic. So some animals like uh, California jays have figured this out and they'll kill a newt and then just tear open its belly and eat the insides and they'll be just fine. So um, being highly toxic is not foolproof uh, for survival if predators know how to get around that. And um, these, are, these are newts that are, I've held a million newts, they're not going to hurt you if you don't have like cuts or anything like that on your hand. I would, if you have like cuts on your hand, ah, I would kind of avoid touching a newt, wash your hands afterwards. These newts are toxic to humans, however, if you eat them. And the way that was found out was because I believe it was in the 60s and 70s, there were actually two young men in their early 20s. Um, one of them ate a newt on a dare and died. About a decade later, another guy ate a newt again on a dare and was hospitalized and severely ill for quite some time. So that is how we know that the newts are toxic to humans. 
If you've ever been on South Park Road in Tilden, you might have seen this road close sign, and that is closed because there are such a number of newts that migrate over that road to their birth pools to mate during winter. And there were like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of newts that were getting smashed by cars. And so um, at some point, I forget when, it was about two decades ago, I believe, um, the park decided to close that road so the newts could um, migrate safely. So we've got the yellow-eyed Encetina. This is a type of salamander. And this is an interesting salamander because this is not an amphibian that gives birth or that lays eggs in the water. They actually lay their eggs on land. And you know, the babies develop in this contained aquatic environment. And then when they hatch out, they're these tiny little versions of the adults. So they don't really go through um, metamorphosis. And you can see they've got their, um, the yolks in their bellies here, kind of like little baby chicks. So the color is very similar to California newt. That is not by accident. It's, um, you know, coloration that is trying to mimic the coloration of a more toxic um, cousin, essentially. And that eh, cousin's maybe the wrong word, but a, a more toxic animal. Um, and these are actually uh, lungless salamanders. So they breathe exclusively through their skin. And there are some interesting evolutionary theories as to why some salamanders don't have lungs. It's thought that um, when you know, they were evolving, lungs actually got in the way of an aquatic lifestyle because they were so buoyant. They would have to kind of fight against the buoyancy of their own lungs. Another hypothesis is that um, if that's how they lost their lungs, perhaps they never um, evolved those lungs or analog structures back because generally these salamanders, if they're lungless, they tend to live on land in like these tiny little cracks and crevices. And um, they can actually live quite far away from bodies of water as long as they can find some kind of small moist environment. And that brings me to California slender salamander, the, um, reigning champion of finding tiny moist environments. I have found like so many slender salamanders where I never ever ever would have expected to find them like you know on highway medians and like in my backyard when I used to you know live in a very urban area. Um, so this is this is another amphibian that people might have had experience with and maybe you've seen it while gardening or digging or flipping over rocks and logs when you're outside. This is another lungless salamander. And, um, you know, speaking of evolutionary theories, this is a teeny weeny little animal that can really cram itself into some tiny damp little places. And you can see this is a hatchling here. Same thing as the Encetina. They do not rely on aquatic environments for young. They lay their eggs in um, damp areas and the young hatch out as tiny little versions of the adults. And um, these are, the hatchlings are actually some of the smallest of all terrestrial vertebrates. And it's, I mean, it's like wild to think about how like there's little bones in that tiny leg. There's like a skull in that tiny little head. There's a spine in there. It just kind of blows my mind how there's like a skeleton in there and all kinds of other stuff. So that's kind of the general overview of some of the major amphibians uh, in our area in the two county area. And one of the things that we take into consideration at the parks are amphibian conservation and fire management. So this is kind of um, what I was talking about a little bit earlier. So when we're talking about ranches, when we're talking about public land, grazing on public land, this is actually a really, really import, important part of ecological management as well as species conservation especially for these two threatened species, the California red-legged and tiger salamander. Um, so it's kind of twofold. The grazing is there to reduce the fuel load of the many uh, introduced annual grasses that you'll find in the parks. So if we didn't have grazing, we would just get buildup of like all of these annual grasses that grow and die and grow and die every year. And you would just get this thatching, which just means like a buildup of dead grass which would essentially turn these areas into giant tinder boxes. So that's where the cattle grazing comes in. So that's a really important uh, fuel management tool to make sure that we don't have too much dead vegetation that can catch on fire. 
Another really important part of grazing is that it introduces these cattle ponds, which um, is there, these have, it's been discovered that these are crucial breeding habitats for animals, especially amphibians. Um, and so the other thing is that California tiger salamanders and red-legged frogs, they're like pretty, they're not huge animals. So when you have all of this grass growing up and thatching over itself, it makes it really hard for them to move around in the landscape. And so not only are the ponds helpful, but the actual action of grazing to physically reduce the barriers that they have to getting from their pond to burrowing sites is really important. And um, it's, it's considered highly, highly likely that this species, um, the frogs and salamanders, would have even smaller current distributions were it not for the creation and maintenance of livestock ponds. So I was saying before how, um, you know, the, the way that livestock ponds look do not necessarily conform to what we might assume is high quality habitat. Um, muddy stock ponds that don't really have much vegetation around them are actually pretty high quality breeding habitats oftentimes for uh, California tiger salamanders and red-legged frogs. And when I was um, helping out with the species survey, we were, you know, we had nets and we were going in these ponds and like scooping like down to the bottom of the pond to see who was there. And every time I brought up my net, there were like 30 newts and frogs in like every single little scoop of net. It was astonishing. I mean, just in this small little cattle pond, I wouldn't be surprised if there were thousands upon thousands of individual amphibians in there. It was amazing. I've never seen abundance like that in my life. It was incredible. So how else are we managing the lands or working to manage the lands? One of the things that the district is involved in is an ecological health assessment. And this is based off the one TAM model in Marin in which uh, one TAM is a coalition of various organizations who work together and pool their information to get a general overview of the health of the area. Since we all know that nature is not interested in jurisdictional boundaries, um, the organizations are trying to get together to make sure that information is shared and analyzed so we have kind of this comprehensive understanding of what's going on in the environment. So it's a coordinated approach through a number of different agencies, um, these agencies specifically for our East Bay e Ecological Health Assessment. And this is part of a long-term plan for continued stewardship and working together. And these are two of the indicator species who are being looked at, the California red-legged frog and the tiger salamander. And um, additionally, part of this assessment is to look at the effects of fire on these two species, since there's really not that much information on what happens to them in the aftermath of all of these fires. And so one way that that's happening is the district stewardship department is taking water quality data during the winter and also the early spring to see how amphibians are doing. And if you are interested in learning more about amphibians, especially amphibians around here, these are some great resources. CaliforniaHerps.com is a very reputable site about all kinds of reptiles and amphibians. iNaturalist is a great resource to see where you can find these amphibians. And then the classic field guide for California is the Stebbins Amphibians and Reptiles of California. And um, the Oakland Public Library does have some copies of the field guide. Ooh, one more research resource um, is this report right here. If you are interested in learning um, all the gory details about rangelands, frogs, and salamanders, this is a report that is free online. You can download it as a PDF. And I would suggest just Googling grazing red-legged frogs, tiger salamander, and it's going to be one of the first things that pops up. So with that, I hope that you have learned something interesting or had an aha moment of some sort. Um, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. You can also email me if you have any other uh, follow-up questions or thoughts.
Thank you so much, Constance. Um, I'm not seeing questions in Facebook right now. Let me just give people a few more minutes. Um, I um, had a question and it went right out of my head. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I did like the part of your uh, presentation when you confessed to have helped. Help, you said I've held millions of salamanders or something. <laughs> millions. I thought that that was quite a claim to fame. <laughs> it was a bit of hyperbole. <laughs> um, it's been more than tens, though. <laughs> more than ten. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I have to tell you, I will never look at dirty cattle ponds the same way. Yeah. Or, or the the idea of cattle grazing in our parks. It makes a lot more sense to me now. So I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I'm just hearing seeing some thank yous on our Facebook page, and I'm not seeing any questions, just those thank yous. Okay. Um, so this was awesome and this was a really interesting talk. Um so I, maybe we will go ahead and say good night for the night. Um, and nobody here in Zoom has questions. Um, and you, you were kind enough to give people your uh, email. And of course, you can always um, ask at the library if you have questions too. Um, Constance, thank you so much. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Yeah. We will see. Um, you back on the 9th of February for a talk about migrating birds. I'm looking forward to that. Great. Okay. Me too. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Take care.